If there is one thing I have observed about rules, it is that virtuous people do not need them, and evil people will always find a way around them. And so we must accept our limitations, and the sad truth that no human society will ever achieve the utopia for which it strives. In mathematics, we would call it an asymptote, a line that can be approached but never reached. Because the only way to create a utopia is with the ever-present threat of force, such as the golden rule. This and no other is the root from which a tyrant springs when he first appears as a protector. And life under tyranny is no utopia at all. How exactly did we get here? Well, I'm glad I asked. You see, in the year 2012, a little-known game you may have heard of known as Skiraim released modding tools, allowing the community to create their own content for the game and release it upon an unsuspecting populace. At the same time, a young man by the name of Nick Pierce, who was working as a lawyer at the time... Oh, oh Mr. Goodman! Really? You didn't recognize him either, Your Honor. ...had been cooking a brand new idea for a narrative-driven mod for the game. And the mod only took him a measly, hmm, 1,700 hours to complete, releasing in 2015 as the Forgotten City. And well, how did it do? This next mod is the result of over 1,700 hours over the course of three years by one modder. That, my friends, is dedication. And this, my friends, is the Forgotten City. Today, I'll be carrying on with my reviews of DLC or quest mods, and this time, I'll be taking a look at the Forgotten City. I'm taking a look at the Forgotten City, a new quest mod. Hello and welcome to Grow Jewel. This time, we have the Forgotten City. Well, if my memory serves me right, for a straight year, no one could shut up about it. It was in every mod spotlight, in every mod recommendation, and in every single one of my playthroughs. And why shouldn't it be? It was intelligently written, well put together, had several endings, and even featured voice acting, which was very uncommon at the time. Personally, I remember playing it back in 2017, and although my memory of it prior to making this video was a bit foggy, I still remember it as one of the greats. You know, like False Guard, Mates 2, and Clockwork. No, not that one, that one. It even became the first mod, as in ever, to win an actual writing award from none other than the prestigious Australian Writers Guild. So imagine my shock when one day I booted up the YouTubes only to find out that they were making a video game based on that mod using the Unreal Engine 4. Nick even quit his day job so he can work non-stop on the game, which came in useful because he reportedly worked 80 hour weeks to get the game working in time. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. It mentions in the wiki article that he was working to the point of hallucinations, which, given the theme of this game, what was my man hallucinating on? How to be a Greek. Watch Kostadin Kerlenis every week for 20 years and then die. The game released in July of 2022 from a small development team of a core of three people, and it also received critical appraise from mainstream game critics. Do you doubt the ability of most esteemed companies such as IGN to probably review a narrative experience in a grand total of five-ish minutes? Well, me too. So let me take you through an 100% spoiler-filled journey, and I'm repeating this, there's gonna be a lot of spoilers in this journey, of the Forgotten City, the great mod that became an even greater game. And I'm telling you this right now, if you're someone who's in the fence about whether they should play this game or not, go play it. It's worth it. But if you just want someone to buzz at your ears for two hours for a game's philosophical and historical implications, then hop right in. I got you covered. So, what changed? Well, for one, the script for the game is more than double that of the mods. We are no longer in Tamil, so forget everything you knew about Imperials and Dwemer, as they have been replaced by their real-life equivalents. Romans and Greeks. Names have also changed from Nordic names to Latin names, and all the races have been replaced with people that lived during the Roman Empire, as the game takes place in the year 65 AD. For context, the world at this time looks like this, and Emperor Nero just finished burning down Rome to make some sick tunes. And honestly, I sympathize. How is one supposed to make a lit bit if your empire isn't lit enough to begin with? But let's put all that aside for now, as we wake up unconscious in the present day after a stranger finds us passed out and floating in the surface of the river Tiber. So, wanna tell me who you are? It is important to pick an appropriate name for the historical period we're about to enter. <clears throat> I am Tahena Win. There are some ruins just behind you. Roman, I think. I need you to go in there and see if you can find a guy named Al for me. He went in there a few hours ago, and he hasn't come out. I've been freaking out, wondering if he's trapped, or injured, or worse. I would have gone in after him, but he made me promise to stay here, no matter what. There's no way I'm leaving without him, so I'm just kind of... stuck here, waiting. I need... 
What I mean is, I was hoping you wouldn't mind going in there to find him. If you can do that, I can get both of you back to civilization in my boat. Please? Oh, of course. Sorry, I don't mean to be pushy. I just... What do you want to know? What is your name? My name's... Karen. <laughs> they warned us about people like you! Oh, there's not much to tell. Feels like I've spent my whole life in a dead-end job with an endless commute. Know what I mean? So off we go to the ruins to find all. Outside the ruins, he left a note that reads... If you're reading this, it means I've discovered the entrance to an ancient Roman city hidden deep underground. Its existence is long forgotten. All knowledge of it lost, except in the Latin inscription here. It reads, You who wish to enter the city, step forth and be judged. You will have to forgive me about minor freezes throughout the gameplay. There are autosave areas in this game. And quick PSA about autosaving areas. They were tolerated two decades ago during Half-Life 2. Now they're just annoying. Inside the ruins of the city, we find a lot of golden statues that depict ancient people of Rome in suffering and running away from something. The city itself is, well, ruined. But while searching in it, we find another note by this Alworth character. To whoever reads this, I'm sorry you had to find me like this. And worse. She'll suffer the same fate I did. I've spent a lifetime in this place, going around and around in circles, searching for a way out. The inscription was right. There is no way back. And here there are only two options. Death, and that godforsaken doorway into the past. We made the mistake of stepping through it. I wanted to set things right. And I tried. I really tried. Whatever I did, it took me right back to the beginning. Don't make the same mistake. Better to end it all now. Find out what awaits you beyond that portal. So with nothing else to do, we jump right into the portal. There is also this female voice whispering to us, asking us who we are and telling us to basically get in the portal. So that's kind of weird. On the other side of the portal is the same city, but this time in the year 65 AD. And immediately we are greeted by a farmer named Galerius. Uh, salve, friend. I'm Galerius. Mind telling me who you are and what you were doing in the Shrine of Proserpina? Who is Proserpina? Yeah, you know, agricultural goddess of springtime? You're not from around here, are you? Oh, I see what you did there, changing the subject like that. Nice try. But I'll ask again, who are you and what were you doing in the Shrine? I am Tahinawi, and I come from the future. Uh... No idea what you're talking about. Oh, wait. Are you a bit, you know, not right in the head? <sighs> That's all right, friend. Everyone's welcome here. You seem very lost, and in more ways than one. So let me make this nice and simple for you. Live by our law here, and we'll all get along just fine. Uh, what law are you talking about? Not laws law. There's just one, the golden rule, and the punishment for breaking it's, well, it's kind of horrific. But our magistrate insists we take all newcomers to see him, so I guess I'll let him fill you in. So then, you coming? So one thing I want to re-emphasize on is the fact that this game was made by a core team of three people. So don't expect the facial animations and the textures to be spotless. They're pretty good, but they're not exactly spotless. Delirious. You're meant to be working the farm, not trudging dirt into the villas. Take it easy, Horatius. I was just taking our new friend here to see the magistrate. Well, he's asked me to escort the newcomer personally. The farm. Go. Now. You better go with him. But just remember, they're not like you and me. Don't let them use you. What was that? What did you just say? Uh, I said it'll take some getting used to. Yeah, I'm watching you, farm boy. This early interaction with Aradius is just an introduction, but he says something pretty neat that allows us to understand the concept of the Golden Rule. So I just want to let it play. The only thing you really need to understand right now is the Golden Rule. Let me see if I can explain it this way. When I was serving in the Legion, 
If there was a mutiny brewing in one cohort, the legate in charge wouldn't waste time finding the bad apples among hundreds. They just divided us into groups of ten, made us draw straws, and whoever drew the short straw had to be executed by the other nine. Didn't matter whether he'd done anything wrong. One of us in ten would die for the crimes of the Collective. We call it decimation. If that seems like rough justice to you, you're in for a rude shock. Because the Golden Rule is exactly ten times worse. We're finally alone. I assume you already know who I am. May I know your name? I am Dahina Win. A curious name to match a curious accent. But I digress. I see you have the piercing and astute eyes of Athena. You must be a woman of great learning. We're always happy to welcome another scholar to our little community. Equitia will be delighted to meet you, I'm sure. Now, you're probably wondering why I summoned you, and I'll get to that. But first, take a look at this wondrous place, would you? A secret city built deep in the mountains many hundreds of years ago. More importantly, consider the miraculous community we've built here over the last seven months. Twenty-two complete strangers brought together by the fates living and working together in our own little paradise. And in all that time, not a single sin has been committed. No fights, no theft, nothing. Have you ever witnessed something so extraordinary as a city without sin? Well, I have seen a man turning himself into a pickle, and it was hilarious, so I'd say, I'd say yes. Well, I'm not sure I believe that. But the reason for this, this miracle is as simple as it is terrifying. If even one person commits a sin here, every last one of us will die. You see, the builders of this place, whoever they were, left inscriptions warning the many shall suffer for the sins of the one. From what we can gather, breaking the law here will anger the gods and provoke a terrible punishment. Like the curses of Medusa and Midas combined, turning us all to gold. We've come to call it the Golden Rule. It's extraordinary that we've survived as long as we have, and each day I grow more and more afraid that our time in the sun is almost up. And now it seems that day is finally here. All that matters is that somebody in this city is about to break the Golden Rule. Why else would Proserpina send you now? Unless you and I can stop them, our doom is assured. I know that's a lot to take in, and you look like you have questions. Please, ask away. Well, what even counts as I seen here? An intelligent question. There was a good deal of debate about that in our first weeks here. Does it refer to crimes, or to some other ill-defined wrong? Of course, everyone agrees on the basics. No theft, no assault, and certainly no murder. But beyond that, it was more difficult to reach a consensus. What about lying? Insulting someone? Blasphemy? Trespass? Trying to escape? Bribery? Infidelity? Suicide? As magistrate, I had to exercise leadership, and so I made a decision. We must uphold the laws of the Empire to a standard never before seen. And we must honor the peace of the gods, the sacred accord between the gods and the people of Rome. It is only by offering the gods the proper respect that we may prosper, as Rome has for centuries. Many of your laws and customs are considered barbaric where I'm from. Barbaric? Barbaric? What are you talking about? The Empire is the most civilizing force in the known world. Rome is a beacon of light in the darkness. For 800 years she has borne great statesmen, philosophers, poets, artists and engineers. 
We have comprehensive laws protecting the rights of our citizens, which have unified countless warring tribes all across the Mediterranean and beyond, from Gallia to Judea. All our citizens are treated the same, regardless of the color of their skin or their sexual preference. Can you say the same? When our people are starving, they are given food rations. And when they are wronged, they have the right to bring the guilty party before the magistrate. Our laws forbid treason, murder, assault and rape, as well as theft and arson and so on. No other civilization in the world is so advanced and you have the, the hubris to call us barbaric? Anything you tell him, he's just gonna respond to with no you. So don't bother arguing with him. For him, Rome is superior. And as facts. How did I end up here? You see, in my search for a way to save my people, I learned of an ancient ritual to Proserpina, the goddess of the cycle of life and renewal. It's said to open a doorway in time, so that if the unthinkable happens, one person can pass through it and travel back. To the past. And when I saw you arrive in a flash of light from the goddess's shrine, I knew that person was you. You don't belong in our time, do you? I am from 2000 years in the future. 2000 years? That is unfathomable. Please tell me, in your time, what did you see? What had become of us? Of this city? You all turn into golden statues. I have imagined it. Our downfall a thousand times. But it still breaks my heart to hear the truth of it. Do you have any suspects? Do you ever stare at a problem for so long that you can't see it for what it is anymore? What's needed here is a fresh pair of eyes. The less I prejudice the independence of your investigation, the better. If I do, will I go back in time? If I understand Proserpina's ritual correctly, that problem should take care of itself. And let me see if I can explain. If you manage to prevent the sin that breaks the golden rule, I won't need to bring you here. I won't create the portal, and you will never have been able to come here. Thus, you'll have created a paradox. If this occurs, you should be flung back to your own time, having changed the past for all of us. Make sense? Yeah, sure, why not? Wonderful. Now, I need you to investigate the city, talk to everyone, help them, if it will win their trust. I authorize you to enter private homes and inspect possessions and documents, unless, of course, you're asked to leave. Figure out who the culprit is, and as soon as you have a name, come back and tell me immediately. Oh, and one last thing. If I were you, I'd start my investigation by visiting Lucretia at the Shrine of Apollo in the Forum. I heard wailing from there not long ago. Seems like something's not right. Alright, cool story, but I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'm gonna talk with his daughter downstairs. Her dialogue establishes that blasphemy doesn't break the golden rule, and she even mentions that her sister has gone missing. Did you hear that? Curse you, you coward! Where is my sister? What do you have to say for yourself? No response. Nothing. <laughs> That's what I thought. I will help you find her. Oh, thank you. You should probably take a look through her room. It's the one just by the front door. Maybe you'll find something the rest of us missed. Now, <laughs> we talk about main character syndrome a lot in this channel. And so when you enter the room, the first thing you see, the first thing you see is the note Centilla left on her bed. So you bring the note back to her sister and she says, bro, that's such a crazy story. I swear I never saw that before you came in. What? Really? I swear, I searched her room top to bottom and never saw that. I wonder how I could have missed it. Strange, but... Well done, I suppose. But it's odd. It was only a few months ago that Santilla's friend Yulia let slip she was planning an escape of her own. And yet, Yulia's still here. You should go and speak with her. Find out if she knows anything. She lives in the villa next door. Asking about Yulia to the bodyguard slash gladiator next door, and he has this to say. I had to carry her to Lucretia's clinic this morning. Shrine of Apollo. She was acting sick. Faking it if you ask me. Typical. 
What he just said ties this event together with the scream the Magister told us about earlier, which is only the first of many examples of intertwined plotlines that exist within the Forgotten City, so get used to them. The Gladiator also mentions that an election is coming up and that his master, a man named Maliolus, has the vote advantage he needs in order to win. Another small detail I want to mention about this place, if you approach the entrance to the systems behind the Gladiator, he has this to say. Hey, you're not thinking about going into the cistern, are you? Well, I'm planning to. Nobody's told you about Hannibal. Ugh, why do I have to do everything around here? So, there was this guy called Hannibal, right? Funny accent. You should go down into the cisterns looking for junk he could clean up and sell. One day, a few weeks back, he comes out and tells me the cisterns are haunted. Said he could hear spirits wailing. Of course, nobody believed him, because who trusts the Carthaginia, right? Anyway, a few days later, he goes back in. And hours go by, and he hasn't come back out, yeah? So I go down after him, and it's dark. But in the distance, I can just make out his body sprawled out on the ground. And hunched over him was something that made my blood run cold. No word of a lie. I saw a creature. Like the corpse of a man who'd been flayed. And it was eating Hannibal. So what did you do? What any sane person would have done. I legged it out of there and put a sign at the door to warn the others. Before we go to the Shrine of Apollo and find what's wrong with Yulia, I want to mention two other events that are happening in parallel with her being sick in the shrine. If instead of heading towards the temple in the left we go upstairs on the right, we find a palace with a locked door and a note which reads, Note from Nivea. I'm locking myself in. Don't try to follow me. Nothing good will come of it. You can also hear someone beating something up on the other side of the door. And the voice of the woman I mentioned before we enter the portal keeps whispering to us about a bow. Also, ahem... This has nothing to do with the mod itself, but during my first playthrough, and all the footage you're seeing here is from my second playthrough by the way, but during the first time I played this game, I kept hearing this metallic sound every so often as I was walking, and I had no idea what it was, until this specific moment in which I realized, oh shit, the statues are actually turning their heads to look at me. Bro, that's so interesting. Anyway, the second event I want to talk about takes place in front of the Great Temple at the peak of the city. A lot has to be said about this temple actually, but for now, all that needs to be observed is that there is this weird looking obelisk near it, which is missing a bunch of plaques. There is this lady cleaning the place that you can chat with and she mentions that she's actually a Christian hiding her faith here, which is somewhat important, but not nearly as important as the event that happens after you end your dialogue with her. And if you ever... I can't believe this is how it ends. Oh no! No! No, 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 no! Wolf Pierce, what are you doing? Get back from there! If you lose your balance, you'll fall! That's the idea. What? Why? Why would you want that? Why do you think I'm stuck for the rest of my life working for a man who treats me like an animal? I know, I know things are hard for you right now. They're hard for all of us. We're all in this together, Ulpius. Please, please just think this through. If you do this, it could be the sin that seals all of our fates. Is that what you want? I'm sorry, but I just don't care anymore. Please, Ulpius. Help him. If he goes through with it, it could be the end for us all. Well, I don't know what to do. I've never had to deal with this sort of thing. Let me guess. You're going to lecture me on how suicide is a crime against the Empire. You must think I'm an idiot. I am out. Wherever you are, Centilla, my love. I'm sorry. Opius, no! I... I can't believe he went through with it. I... Oh, Lord. That poor lamb. Uh, what happens now? I'll have to let everyone know what happened. And I guess Maliolus will have to clean up the mess in his villa. It's of his own making, after all. And I'd best pray for poor Ulpius. Now, after this incident, we hear the voice again, but this time it's telling us to jump just like the guy before us did. <sighs> now, I don't know about you people, but when the voices in my head tell me to go jump off a cliff, I do it without questioning or hesitating. Thank you. 
When we jump, we fall in the water pit created by the fall of Ulpius, and we are now in Maliolus' villa. What I imagine, and I know this circumstance I'm about to mention is the product of different events happening at the same time without any scripted interaction between them, but I just want to imagine that Meliolas saw one of his servants falling into the fountain, breaking both himself and the fountain in the process, and then looked to himself and thought to himself, Hmm, really good day to practice my speech for today's election, innit? And, uh, and now, I make this solemn promise to you, good citizens, um, under my leadership you will finally enjoy the freedom you deserve. For the purposes of comedy, this is the canon I'm going with. The conversation with Maliolas is pretty straightforward too. He hates the golden rule and plans to repeal it as soon as he becomes magistrate. Some other notable things that happen in Maliolas' house is his battered wife who is crying alone in her bedroom, and a letter left behind by Yulia next to a cup of poison which reads, Yulia to her captors Meliolus and Claudia, curse you both to the depths. By the time you are reading this, I will already be dead, because death is preferable to another day in dead bondage to you. May vultures peck on your livers in Tartarus for all eternity. Now we know why Yulia is feeling sick. She poisoned herself. So we finally go to the Temple of Apollo. And it's a real testament to this game that this was the first thing we were told to do, but through investigating other events we were able to ignore it and come back to it later, while still investigating it through different events that somehow correlate to it. In the temple, there is a woman called Lucretia who has this to say. Give me a moment. Sorry I'm such a mess. I just lost a patient and a dear friend. Julia, she was a good woman. She was poisoned. She came in here frothing at the mouth. Normally I'd treat her with resin of sylphium, a rare plant which is perfect for this sort of thing. And I knew Dacius had some at his market stall, right around the corner. So I ran over there, but he just looks at me with this evil smile and says, That'll be a thousand denarii. There was no way I could afford that. And he knew it. Then that toad shrugs and says, Supply and demand. I guess you don't value your friend's life that highly. Anywhere else, I'd just pay a thug to steal it from his stall. But there's no way I can do that down here with the golden rule. So all I could do is come back here and just watch her die. I kept on apologizing. And now I'll never know who poisoned her or how they managed to do it without breaking the golden rule, or why she cursed that snake's cruel black eyes with her dying breath. So, because we did all that, we know that she took her own life, and the person she was referring to was Maliolas' wife. Lucretia tells us to get the medicine for her, so she never has to see another person die like that again. She also tells us that one of her patients is suffering from rheumatism, and only Nivia knows how to cure them. Before we find a way to deal with her problems, I think it's best to talk with some of the other residents of the city so we can learn their problems. So first there's this French guy called Virgil, who is being harassed by an unknown Christian for being gay. Damn, okay, that was a sentence. Let's take a step back. The suspect is harassing him by filling his walls with graffiti. Ah, yes. How can we possibly forget? Roman graffiti. It is the wise and enduring voice of the Roman people, a sign that Roman society composed of more than just aristocrats and senators. Weep you girls. My penis has given you up. Now it penetrates men's behinds. Goodbye wondrous femininity. Theophilus had an orgy with four girls here, and he disappointed all of them equally. This is of course highly unsurprising, given the fact that Roman toilets look like this. You would think that they could have added like a wooden door or something to separate each other, but the fact is, they didn't. They saw those toilets, and they probably thought to themselves, you know what? A number two requires a company of at least two. Anyway, I'm getting off topic again. There is this other character called Dooley who is mentally ill and so the magistrate had him locked up in fear that he might unwittingly break the golden rule. There's also this guy called Rufus who after doing a little bit of scooping in his room we found out that he's actually the guy harassing Virgil. Uh, confronting him about it doesn't actually make him stop right now, so... There is also Galerius the farmer whom we've already met, and Livia the old lady who's lost her sanity. How did she lose her sanity, you might ask? We don't know yet, but the loss of her sanity gave her immaculate foreshadowing powers. Lastly, for now at least, I want to mention the priestess Equitia, who has something very interesting to say when you tell her about how you ended up in the city. But what about you? How did you end up here? A young woman named Karen dragged me out of the river, and then she sent me here. Karen, you say? And nothing about that name seemed odd to you. It's an older name, but it's very common where I'm from. Older? I see. Hmm. I wonder if... No. I 
I apologize. I don't mean to be cryptic. It's just that you've got me thinking. Have you spoken with any of the others about how they arrived here too? I really think you should. Go around and ask them what they remember and see if you notice any patterns. We will get back on these patterns later. What happened to Livia? Up until a few weeks ago, she was a perfectly productive member of our little community, darning clothes and cutting hair. She was always so chatty, always seeking out newcomers and asking them where they were from and how they wound up here. And then, about a month ago, she suddenly changed. She withdrew, stopped working and became despondent, started muttering to herself. Galerius and I visited her to see how we could help. But she just looked at us with this haunted stare, called us bloodless shadows and told us we were ignorant of some pattern. Look, it could be unrelated. Perhaps she simply fell ill. Or, as Galerius suggested, the weight of the golden rule was too much for her. But there is a small chance that she learned something, saw a pattern nobody else saw, and that it broke her. I just don't want to see that happen to you. So be careful, will you? All right, I'll do that. But for now, we have to get the antidote from Decius. You can either commit a crime which breaks the golden rule, but unlocks a room in which there is a chest with a lot of denarii in it. Or you can just steal the item and break the rule anyway. So naturally, I did both. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. Which one of you idiots did this? After breaking the rule, we have to rush back to the shrine, wait until Sentius opens the door, and then start over. So before we start the loop again, I feel like it's necessary to gather all the clues we have so far, so we don't get lost in the sauce. So far we know that we were sent here by the acting magistrate to stop a scene from happening and trashing this place, and we also know that the new magistrate who is gonna get voted after the end of this election, plans to end the golden rule after he gets elected. We also know that the acting magistrate's daughter has gone missing, and her lover Ulpius wants to commit suicide together with Maliolis' other servant, Yulia. There's also the fact that a member of the city, Navia, has locked herself in a palace and is currently beating something in there. Other things that seem kind of suspect are Meliolas' wife crying alone in the bedroom, Dooley being mentally unwell and getting locked up for it, the whole side pulled with Rufus and Virgil, and most interestingly, what Equitia told us to be aware of when we talked to other people in the city about how they ended up here. In fact, this realization she told us about is so horrifying that it even turned another citizen, Levia, insane. Oh, also, according to the gladiator, someone got eaten in the cisterns. All things considered, I guess it's more appropriate to ask who will not break the golden rule rather than who will at this point. Okay then, with all that in mind, we enter the second loop inside the Forgotten City. coming outside the shrine again, and this is a fun little addition to not make the game seem so repetitive. You can actually tell Galerius to complete tasks for you, so you don't have to do them again, such as giving Yulia the antidote, stopping Ulpius from going full Assassin's Creed mode without the hay at the bottom of the church, and so on and so forth. Okay, here's another event I didn't mention in the first round. Right outside the baths of the city, we can find this encounter. Help! You have to do something! A man arrived in the baths! A real nasty sort, with his face all covered up, and he's got a weapon. You have to do something, or he's gonna break the golden rule. Thank you. He's still in there, somewhere. I have to hide. Find me in this empty shrine when it's over. Here the voice tells us not to allow the woman to go inside the shrine, but I just want to let you see this absolute oblivion style encounter if you do let her go inside the shrine. Hear what? What? We don't have time for this. I have to go. Ugh. The shrine is collapsing. <laughs> Fabia, no! Real heartbreaking stuff on the Kotha channel today, I know. So we tell her to go somewhere else, and then we confront the assassin. Stop right there. I am looking for Tiberius Quinctius Crispus, otherwise known as Quinctius. Do you know where he is? Yes, I saw him worshipping in a small round shrine just outside the city. Thank you. For your service to the Empire, I'll let you live for now. But you'd best make sure our paths don't cross again. 
Curse you, cultist. <laughs> Huh. Well, wouldn't you know? The Assassin's Corpse is basically a loot fiesta. You can take his bow, his arrows, a single denarii, and a note which reads, By order of Emperor Nero, all loyal sons of Rome are ordered to hunt and execute an arsonist and a murderer, Tiberius Quinctius Crispus, a citizen from the Aventine district of Rome. He is about 40 to 50 years old. He is average height, average build, has black hair, and has one green eye and one blue one. He is typically clean-shaven. He is a non-associate of the cultists, and he suffers from delusions of grandeur. Oh yeah, I know that guy. You didn't think I gave all that historical context in the beginning for no reason, did you? No, everything in this channel is for a reason. Except the Ben Shapiro video. That one is on the algorithm, not me, I swear. Confronting Maliolos about his true identity, and he rejects everything without any further proof. And we will get more proof later. The Seven also starts another important questline. After taking the bow, Daisy stops us and tells us the following. You there. I'm sorry to trouble you, but I couldn't help but notice that fine bow you're carrying. No idea how you managed to get your hands on it, especially in the light of our dear old magistrate's ban, but I'm impressed. And before you ask, no, I wouldn't dream of trying to buy it from you. I have no use for a wooden bow myself. But I would like to propose a joint business venture of sorts. Go on. Tell me, do you have any idea how people here end up as golden statues? The statues come back to life and fire golden bows and arrows at them. And here I was thinking I was the only one to figure it out. In any case, supposedly one or two of those arrows is enough to turn a full grown man into gold. He essentially tells us that we should replace the golden bow of the goddess Diana with a bow made out of fake gold so we can gain access to the original without breaking the golden rule. This sounds, uh, unethical. Oh, I'm not suggesting we use such a bow on people. There's no profit in breaking the golden rule. So, are you in, partner? Alright, I'll do it. There's a note here saying that this quest has horror elements to it, but I can assure you, this game is no amnesia. The horror here is very mild and very well put together. So we swap the bows and then we get double crossed. Is that you, partner? Do you have the bow? Yes, I have it. Wonderful. Just go ahead and slide it under the door for me and I'll unlock it for you. Did you lock me in here? A little bit slow, aren't you? Yes, I locked you in. And until you give me my bow, you're gonna stay in there, like Tantalus in Tartarus. How isn't this against the Golden Rule? <laughs> no, technically, I never said that. I said, if we were to split all those riches between the two of us, infinite wealth is still infinite. It's hardly my fault if you can't tell the difference between a hypothetical and a promise now, is it? Oh, I do love a good loophole. How can I trust you after double-crossing me like this? You're just gonna have to take your chances, I'm afraid. The bow, now. And don't even think about giving me the fake one. I'll recognize my own handiwork. There's no way I'm giving you this bow. Hmm. I would reconsider my position quickly if I were you. I'm not sure if you noticed, but you're stuck in there with a hornet's nest. And they can be rather aggressive toward intruders. You know, some say it takes 27 hornet stings to kill a man. But I always wondered how anyone could have known that. Let's find out how many it takes to kill a woman, shall we? Shooting the nest turns it into gold and reveals an underground path which leads us from the sewers to the palace Navia resides in. The golden bow is an insane quality of life upgrade. It turns vines into gold, it enables combat, and it's a puzzle solving tool. Speaking about combat, I have noticed in people's reviews about this game that combat is something people generally consider one of the negative aspects of this game. And I disagree. For one, there are a grand total of 2.5 areas with bodies in this game, and all 2.5 of them are very well put together in terms of aesthetic and explaining why exactly they need to have bodies in them. Also, there is nothing I love more than kicking people, and this game has a kicking mechanism, so I'm sold. And I'm pretty sure that out of all the games I played this year, this one has the best hitboxes, so maybe I'm going easy on it. But the premise is simple. There are these golden zombies running at you, and if you hit them twice with the golden bow, they turn into gold. If you don't have the golden bow or if you run out of arrows, you kick them instead. You can also turn them into gold by turning liquid underneath them into gold. The palace itself is in ruins, and there are these golden creatures roaming around the halls everywhere, along with the palace's only human inhabitant, Navia. You're not supposed to be here. You might be wondering, what are these golden little abominations? And as we go deeper into the palace, we find Navia's journal, which describes where these creatures originate from. My beloved Galatea, after I learned the terrible truth about the golden statues, I wandered the city, 
as if in a nightmare. What must life be like for these poor souls, entombed in gold, but kept alive somehow? Trapped in their own personal Tartarus, consigned to eternal torment, too horrific for any sane mind to comprehend. I tried to offer them what small mercies I could. I began to talk to them, to keep them company. I'd imagine backstories for them, give them names, and tell them of the world, of the histories and stories I'd learned as a child. As the others became more concerned by my charity, I sought solitude from them, preferring the company of my tormented charges. Discovering a way into the abandoned palace, I began to spend my days walking its halls and sharing with its occupants ancient tales, my mind turning to those of Apollo and Daphne, Perseus and Medusa, and Pygmalion and Galatea. Pygmalion, the sculptor who fell in love with a beautiful statue, and who, praying to Aphrodite for aid, discovered that his beloved Galatea had come to life. It was then that I heard you whisper to me, Galatea. Forgive me. I know that is not your real name, just one I have borrowed from a story. But when I turned to look at you, I saw the most exquisitely beautiful woman I have ever known. Your face forever frozen in a look of haunting sadness. Our meeting gave me new purpose to free you from your golden prison so that I might one day hear you speak, not just whisper your true name to me. So I gathered tools for the long and difficult task ahead, barred the doors to this place, and set to work. I love storytelling like this. I always like it when they take a small, already well put together concept such as golden statues that come back to kill you if you sin, and then they give it another angle by saying, oh I don't know, a woman fell in love with one of the statues and now she wants to break them free so she can be with her imprisoned lover. And combining that with the story of Galatea and Pygmalion is just so... What's the word, Gordon? Delicious. Finally. Some good fucking food. The palace level, as I said earlier, is very well put together. And enemies come at you from all different directions, so I found myself drawing the bow preemptively in case of any little anorexic model deciding to gag up on me, which they did pretty often actually. Navigating to the palace gives us access to another one of Nivea's journals. My beloved Galatea, my attempts at freeing these souls from their golden prisons have not been going to plan. My first charge was a Greek woman, who I called Iodami after the Athenian turned to stone by Medusa. Drilling through the gold that encased her, I was vindicated by the discovery that beneath half an inch of gold, which is so rigid it must be some kind of alloy, was living flesh. Unfortunately, this golden alloy seems to have fused with her skin, so removing it exposed the sinew and muscle beneath and appeared to cause her great pain. At first, I braced myself, expecting that inflicting such pain would break the golden rule, and yet, somehow, it did not. It seems whichever god is responsible for imprisoning these poor souls does not care about their suffering at all. They are forsaken. Undeterred, I pressed on, working late into the night, attempting to remove the golden layer that encased her as delicately as I could. Eventually, I was able to free most of her body, but when I released her from her restraints, her first act was to lunge for my throat, clawing at me with all her strength and those sharp metal talons. This was my thanks for trying to save her. Whatever possessed Iodami to attack, she was clearly not a suitable subject for my experiment, and I was forced to lock her inside an isolated wing of the palace and bar the door. As I continued working on others, I could hear her flailing and launching herself at the other side endlessly. Regrettably, my other experiments bore similar results, and after relocating a few times, most of the palace is now too dangerous to work in. Still, as much as my heart aches to know that you're suffering, I cannot risk attempting to ungild you yet. 
not until I have perfected a method that will bring you back to me, whole in both mind and body, and ensuring your humanity is preserved. I promise you this, one day we will be together, even if I have to free every last statue in this god's forsaken place. This is great and horrifying and all, but I uh, am... Um, you know I hate suspending disbelief, but I have to question Nivea's scientific protocol. She frees one statue, then said statue goes, I hate you, why did you free me, I am in deep pain, I'm going to kill you. And then she goes, okay, but if I do it again in the exact same way, maybe they'll love me this time. And all the while, her solution to dispensing the anorexic models of Chanel she released from their internal slumber is to just, you know, let them roam around her house, ascending the final floor of the palace, and we find the statue Nivea wants to free. Uh, who are you? You must be Navia. And you must be the wretched snake who broke into my palace and disturbed my experiments. And worst of all, look at what you made me do to her. This never would have happened if you just stayed away. You're going to pay for that. If you attack her, we break the golden rule, so we have to use the smooth talk approach with her. Liar! I locked and barred the gate. I left a message warning you all to leave me alone. I just wanted to do my experiments in peace for her. And now look at her. You made me turn the most beautiful woman I've ever seen into this. Look at her. She's in agony. All I wanted was to spend my last moments with her, to see her beautiful face to hear her speak freely, instead of in those cryptic whispers. But as soon as I began my work, she stopped whispering to me. And now I discover she started whispering to you instead. What's so special about you? It's not the statue whispering to me. A lot of them do, but it's always the same voice. What do you mean, the same voice? It's someone else whispering to me through the statues. Hmm. Yes. I remember when they used to whisper to me, they did sound similar. I just thought it was because all voices sound the same when they whisper. But now that I think about it, they were all benevolent and seemed to share a common knowledge. But if these bodies are mere conduits for that one voice, then this body is nobody. And everything I've done here was, was, Wait, I see what you're doing. You're trying to steal her away from me. Were you planning to wait until I'd done all the hard work, then swoop in? Is that it? No, I swear. Liar. You tried to steal her away from me, and now look what you made me do. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't peel you too. I ended up here by accident. I just want to leave. What? What are you talking about? Wait. So you're saying you weren't coming for us? I never had any intention of hurting you. So I did all this. I ruined her. For nothing. What have I done? Oh God, I feel sick. I am... I can't bear the thought of her being like this. And in so much pain. It's the air coming into contact with her flesh. It's agonizing for them. But the only way to fix it will be to break the golden rule and let it run its course. At least that way she'd be golden again and we'd be together. All it would take is one little cut. Wait, I can undo this if you tell me the treatment for rheumatism. It's too late. There's nothing you can do. I have to do this. I'm sorry. I can cover her in gold again. Really? I, I'm not sure I believe you. But if you can undo this mess, I'll tell you what you need to know. But if you're lying to me, I'll break the golden rule and kill you and everyone else in this city. Understood? Got it. You did it. You took away her pain. 
I don't know what to say. Thank you, thank you. I swear I will never harm her again. I swear it. I'll stay here to keep her company. But these poor souls, what can be done for them? I've tried everything I can. I fear the only one capable of releasing them properly is whichever god doomed them in the first place. In any case, I must honor our bargain. The treatment for rheumatism is willow bark. I believe there's a pot of it already in the Shrine of Apollo. Now, please leave. The door here leads out onto the palace balcony. You should be able to make your way down from there. After we leave, I want to go behind the tavern where we can find two useful things. There's a shrine to Christ behind the tavern and in it there's a plaque which is going to be coming in very handy soon and there's also an abandoned chest there with a jar of wine in it which is also gonna be coming in handy soon. After we get out of there, we give Lucretia the cure for Yulia and we also tell her the cure for rheumatism, giving the cure to Rufius and he promises to stop harassing Virgil. So that's done and dealt with. Yulia isn't exactly thankful for us saving her life, essentially telling us that we didn't save her life as much as we ruined her death. Now I think we should head to the assistance. In fact, Meliolus claimed that we might find something about Santilla, the girl that went missing down there. So apparently, the monster that was inside the assistance was one of Nivea's experiments that escaped the palace. There, we can find the corpse of Hannibal, and he's holding a pendant that belongs to Santilla, telling that to her sister, just makes her mad, as she now thinks that her smaller sister is dead. So that course of action is not advisable. Now we're getting to the first ending. You see, inside the assistance, there is a really long vine, and if we turn that vine into gold, it allows us to climb all the way up to the aqueduct where we can find Scintilla crying there. You? Who are you? Did he send you? Thank you know you're here. You have to help me save before that monster comes back. What is going on here? I'm Scintilla. I found a way out through the gate of horn, but it's locked. So I told him about it, and instead of helping me escape, he locked me up. He wants to keep us all here forever, or until we're turned to gold. He's a monster. You have to let me go so we can kill him and take his key. Who did this to you? Sentius, my adoptive father. Furies help me. I'll castrate and crucify him. How hasn't this broken the golden rule yet? I don't know. He said the gods are on his side because they don't want us to escape either. What will you do if I release him? I'm going to take that key from around his neck, even if it means cutting his throat to get it. I'm done caring about the golden rule. I just want out. Help me, and we can escape together. What about the others? There won't be enough time. Just you and me. What do you say? If you choose to release her, Sentius comes out of the main entrance. Oh, thank you. Now for... Wait. Did you hear that? He's here. He must be coming in through the door behind me. You distract him. Stay right here and keep him talking while I look for something I can use. What did you do with Centilla? Where is she? I'm not gonna tell you. So that is how it's going to be. Oh well, this doesn't change anything for me. It's a shame, really. If you'd just done what you were supposed to, you'd have been looping through time forever until you gave up and killed yourself. Just like that soft-hearted pleb, Al. Wait, you remember Alworth? Come now. Surely you didn't think you were the only one here who remembered everything. You see, my connection to the portal somehow preserves my memories from one loop to the next. Whether that was Proserpina's intention or a happy accident, I'll never know. But I'm surprised you hadn't noticed. Here I was, thinking you were a little bit sharper than Al was. Or perhaps you're just more willing to break the rules. He was a moralistic fellow, never once compromised on his principles. And because of that fatal flaw, he relived this day many thousands of times before we finally had this conversation. I watched him come through the portal each time, always a little older, a little more disheveled, a little more haunted. And when he finally saw the futility of it all, as you're about to, it broke him. He drank a jug of wine, 
tied a noose around his neck and took his own life just before he was shot with a golden arrow. The next time I awoke, you showed up, but you, you've caught up to where he was so quickly. I'd have preferred if you'd given me more time to enjoy the trappings of my success. How many extra days did you give me? Just the one? Not many. But don't worry, I'm sure there'll be another useful idiot who comes along after you're dead. In any case, there's no escape for you except the path that Al took. The path he wrote about on his tablet. What was it? Ah, yes. Better to end it all now than find out what awaits you beyond that portal. So, you discovered my secret. So what? What are you going to do about it? Why did you do all this? Why? Isn't it obvious? Because I have grown attached to all this. My title, my beautiful villa, the sun on my face, the music of birds chirping. And as long as this day keeps repeating itself, I get to enjoy it all, over and over again. For eternity. Don't you see? I have found a way to prolong my life indefinitely. To cheat death. I have become, in effect, as immortal as the gods. Can you honestly say you would not wish the same for yourself? So you asked me to figure out who's going to break the golden rule, knowing I would fail every time? Of course. There's no way you could have succeeded. Every soul who has ever found themselves here has broken the golden rule eventually. It is inevitable. Man will always sin sooner or later. Any idiot could tell you this. But where others might see tragedy, I saw opportunity. As I told you the first time we met, I found a way to cheat death. By reliving the same day over and over again forever. And I will continue living long after your dust. You're gonna die a horrible death for this. Do you really think you can take on a Decurion with that flimsy little bow? Who? Centilla? Where is she? I'm right here, father. Shaking that ass on the floor. Shall suffer I have his key. for the sins I can open of the one. Come on, we have to go. Hey, what's happening to you? That light, it, it's so bright. When we respawn, we find Al having no memory of what he had been through, or more accurately, what he hasn't been through by now. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Really? That's. Strange. I was just reading an old tablet I found here. Well, trying. My Latin is kind of rusty, but the last entry mentioned someone with the same name. It described an event about 2,000 years ago. Someone with your name appeared in the city out of the shrine of Proserpina. Freed an imprisoned woman named Centilla, who then murdered her captor, breaking some kind of ancient law. It said the attack caused golden statues to come alive, hunting down everyone in the city and turning them into gold. Apparently, the only person to survive was Centilla, while the stranger disappeared in a flash of light. Actually, that was me. Uh, what? You're saying you were here 2,000 years ago. I... I'm not sure I understand. We explain to him what happened, and then we escape from the road Centilla showed us. Karen then finds a tablet left behind by Centilla, she takes us back to civilization, and then we get the second ending. I don't know what became of you, or if you'll ever read this. But I want you to know that I will never forget you, or what you did for me. It pains me that so many dear friends were not so fortunate. Olpius, Sentia, Lucretia, Horatius, Galerius, poor Dooley, and the others. But please understand, their blood is on my hands, not yours. I will live with the consequences of my actions. And all I can do is move forward, trying to show others the same compassion you showed me. I promise you that saving my life will not be for nothing, Centilla. If instead of freeing Centilla, we go confront her father instead, we get another ending. 
So, you discovered my secret. So what? What are you going to do about it? I couldn't care less what you think. Hand over the key to the exit. And why would I agree to that? Okay, what stops me from getting the key through force? The only way you're getting this key is over my dead body. And if I die, I won't be able to open the portal for you again, meaning you'll have created a paradox. You see, it was my actions that brought you to this point in time. So if you kill me, you'll stop me from doing so. And you being here will be an impossibility. That means if I die, you'll be flung back to your original time, having caused the deaths of everyone here, and you'll never be able to undo it. Is that what you want? Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? If we kill him, we return to our original timeline, but this time there is no exit for us to go through, and so both us and Al die alone in those abandoned ruins. Ending one achieved. To get the third ending, we need to tell Santilla that we want to save the others, and so we restart the loop. So we call an early election, Meriolos and his lacking break the rule, and things start over. After we ascend from the shrine, we tell Galerius to get as many people as possible and gather together where Centilla is, aka where the exit is. Then we go back to Centilla, we repeat the same process as we did for the first ending, and then we get out. This ending is basically identical to the first one, where Centilla escaped alone, but the plug is a little different this time. I don't know what became of you, or if you'll ever read this, but Octavia, Lucretia, Horatius, Equitia and I will never forget you, or what you did for us. It pains us that so many of our dear friends were not so fortunate, including Ulpius and Galerius, who heroically tried to rescue Dooley, but never made it back. But there is no point dwelling on what might have been. All we can do is take this gift you've given us and try to show others the same compassion you showed us. We promise you that saving our lives was not for nothing. Centilla et al. And thus, ending 3 has been achieved. Now, me explaining 3 out of 4 endings might give you the idea that we're almost done here, but let me tell you, if this video's length hasn't hinted otherwise, we still have a ways to go before we're done here, as the 4th ending changes everything we thought we knew about the nature of the Golden City, and the fate of its residents. If you noticed, I have been jumping around the dialogue we've had with Princess Equitia, where she advises us to talk to people about how they ended up in the city, and after talking to them, we noticed three patterns. Pattern 1. Some people mention something about a river. Pattern 2. Some people mention something about a coin. Pattern 3. Some people experience memory loss. It's as I feared. I think I understand what poor Livia has been going through. Let me ask you this. Did you happen to encounter a stranger in the forest before you arrived here? I did. A woman named Karen. There's something I think you should see. I think you'd better follow me to the baths. All right, you're here. You were asking how I knew the young woman you met by the river was wearing a hood. Here, look down at the bottom of the baths. It's a little hard to make out in this light. If only we could see. Oh, what a marvelous lamp. But. Do you see it? Somebody waking up by a river in a forest to find a hooded figure with a coin. It's just as you described it, only your pronunciation is a little off. The name you heard wasn't Karen. It was C-H-A-R-O-N, as in Charon, the ferryman of the dead. Charon, who in exchange for the right coin, helps the souls of the newly deceased cross the Styx the river that separates the land of the living from the land of the dead. When I dragged you out of the river, I thought you were never going to wake up. I checked your pockets for ID, but all I found was some loose change. Feels like I've spent my whole life in a dead-end job with an endless commute. Oh my god, Karen with Karen. You have until the sands run from this glass to bark your nonsense. Sorry if I sounded cagey, it's just that... I don't always get the best reactions when I introduce myself. My name's... Karen. I'm so sorry, my friend. I'm so, so sorry. I take it you know what this means. 
I'm afraid so. It's all starting to make sense. All these people whose last memory was running from the fires toward the river. It seems none of them escaped with their lives after all. Perhaps we should be grateful they don't remember their final moments. It also tells us that the Golden Rule is the work of Pluto, the god of the underworld, and why his epithet has always been father of riches. I know it's a lot to take in, and you look as if you have questions, so I'll try to answer them if I can. Who is Caron? Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting you're not from here. If you were Roman, or even Greek, you would know these stories. Each of them is slightly different, whether the storyteller was Plato, Homer, Virgil, or Ovid. But they always involved the souls of the dead, meeting a grim ferryman named Charon on the bank of a river. It was said that he'd help the new arrival cross, only if they could pay him with a coin, an obol. That's why it was once our custom to bury our loved ones with a coin in their mouths. Charon's obol, we called it. Of course, an obol was a kind of Greek coin, because we inherited this knowledge from the Greeks. Yeah, but why are there so few people in the underworld? Good question. Let's see. In the stories, Charon would always require a coin as payment for passage across the river. But that never made any sense to me. What does an ancient immortal being need with coins? In our case, it seems Charon didn't take the coins we had. He or she merely checked we had one in our possession. So, maybe there's something special about the coins each of us had on us. That might explain why we wound up here, but so many others did not. These are all the questions I have. Now that we know where we are, we have to figure out what to do about it, if we don't want to be cast into gold for eternity. We don't have much to go on, except the old stories. I remember four in particular about heroes in the underworld. Hercules, the demigod and son of Jupiter. Orpheus, a Thracian poet. Sisyphus, a king of Ephyra. And Aeneas, a Trojan hero. Hercules was able to leave the underworld because he cowed its god with his strength. Sisyphus and Orpheus both relied on their wits instead. They persuaded the goddess of the underworld, Proserpina, to help them escape. And finally, Aeneas was able to escape with the help of a spirit guide, who led him through a secret gate. So it seems you have two options. To confront the god of the underworld head on, or find a way to escape with the help of Proserpina or some other guide. Tell me about confronting the god of the underworld head on. That option would be the boldest but also the only way to learn the truth about the Golden Rule, and maybe even put an end to it. As I said, Hercules managed to overpower the god of the underworld, but he was a demigod. Forgive my candor, but you are no Hercules. Well, I can manipulate time and turn people into gold. I won't pretend to understand exactly what that means, but if that's true, then perhaps you stand a chance. So. If you want to confront him, I'll help you as much as I can. Who knows? Perhaps your name will be uttered in the same sentence as Hercules one day. But first, you'd need an audience with you-know-who, and for that, you'll need to enter the great temple overlooking the city. The problem is, the door has been sealed shut for as long as I've lived here, and there doesn't even seem to be a keyhole. I suspect the answer lies in the desecrated obelisk in front of it. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there are four plaques missing from its base. It looks as though somebody, or a series of somebodies, forcibly removed them, and in doing so, dishonored and angered our divine keeper. If you could recover and replace all four of those missing plaques, I imagine he might be willing to receive an audience again. What can you tell me about the obelisk? Except, you know, it being the worst god cut. It's the towering stone monument with four sides and a pyramid-shaped head that stands before the great temple, a dedication to the god of this place. You'll find them all over Rome, but of course they were looted from Egypt many years ago. It seems one of them made its way here too, although how is a mystery. However, this one is unusual. 
in that each of the four sides is decorated in a different style, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and another I don't recognize. That means you'll need to recover four different plaques, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, and a fourth, a mystery plaque. How can I find the Greek plaque? I don't know. But perhaps you should begin your search with the local Greek fellow, Georgius. His store is in the forum. How can I find the Egyptian one? Perhaps Kabash, our Egyptian resident, will be able to tell us. Unfortunately, he disappeared weeks ago. But I did hear Aurelia is peddling rumors about him at the tavern. So perhaps you could talk to her or just take a look in his room. How can I find the mystery one? I'm afraid you're on your own with that one. But perhaps finding the other three will illuminate the way. I want to move on from this conversation, but first I think we should listen to what she has to say about Proserpina. Proserpina. What we do know about her is, well, it's a grim tale. It's said the god of the underworld abducted and dragged her here against her will, forcing her into marriage. So she's probably willing to go against his will to help us. If the stories are true, then I suppose so. The problem is, how do we communicate with her without being noticed by her captor? Leaving that aside for a moment, there is also the possibility of a spirit guide. I don't suppose you've come across one of those in your travels? Well, I hear the female statues whispering to me every now and then. And you're only bringing this up now? Then again, I suppose you were worried I'd think you were as mad as Navia. Can you tell me more? Is it the same voice? What kinds of thing does it say? It's the same voice, and it's always helpful. Fascinating. Perhaps she's a benevolent spirit. Or perhaps... Hmm... Perhaps you're hearing the voice of Proserpina herself. If she has indeed been abducted, it would make sense for her to speak in cryptic whispers to avoid detection. Tell me, has she told you anything that might lead you to the way out? This is just foreshadowing for Centilla's location, which we already know by this point, so I'm just gonna skip this part. Okay, cringy semantics aside, I really like this quote-unquote revelation. It brings another layer of mystery to the city by telling us that we're basically in the ancient world's version of hell, it tells us about the god who made this place and created the golden rule, and it also explains who is talking to us through the statues. Now, we need to find four plaques, and if you remember, we already found one of them in the Christian shrine behind the tavern. To get the Greek plaque, we need to talk to an NPC named Georgius. Do you know where to find the Greek plaque? Who's the plague you seek was pilfered from a collection of old Greek relics by none other than Dooley. I feel the need to skip over some events as the process of getting the plaque is quite long and not that interesting. Okay, so to get the plaque we need to free Dooley, and to free Dooley we need to elect Galerius as the new magistrate, but for Galerius to even become a candidate we need to convince Meliolus aka Quinctus Crispus, to drop from the election. And to do that, we need to expose him as the guy who set the Roman fire. To find evidence of this, we need to go over to Maliolas' crying wife, give her the bottle of wine we found behind the tavern, and then she will give us a signed letter by Maliolas, signed with his original name. We confront him with this evidence, and he drops from the race. But that doesn't mean that Galerius wins the election. To do that, we need to restart the loop, and tell Galerius to do all the virtuous deeds we committed in previous loops, which includes curing Julia, stopping Ulpius from arping as Tore by freeing him from slavery, stopping the lady from going into the shrine and telling the assassin to go there instead, and curing Rufus from his illness, therefore stopping him from harassing Virgil. Oh, and we also need to tell him to threaten Maliolas to drop out of the race. See, I told you it was laborious, but I think it's also a credit to the game how all these small things we did so far come together so fluently to progress the narrative of the game. Also, massive shoutouts to Galerius, man, for listening to 100% of what a complete stranger told him without questioning or resisting. Now that's a good man right there. After he gets elected, his first order as magistrate is to free Dooley, and Dooley gives us the plaque and the key to the upper floors of the cisterns where Centilla is. And I have to say, Dooley's actions right after he gets freed destroy any kind of wholesome vibes one can derive from this event in the most perfect way imaginable. Oh, look over there. Something shiny. Is it treasure? Maybe it is treasure. I could see it for myself. So pretty. And it's just lying out here in the open. Maybe nobody wants it anymore. Maybe no one will mind if I just 
take it. Don't you dare. The many. Okay, now we have the Greek and the Roman plaque, and there is only one place in this game we haven't been in yet, besides the Great Temple. Right next to the shrine, there is a temple with an ancient Greek statue in it, and a trapdoor which leads us to some underground catacombs. And in these catacombs, we find an old philosopher who tells us that he will allow us to go deeper into the dungeon if we just tell him the name of the god who runs this place, which we now know is Pluto. Excellent. I see you are indeed quite astute. Very few come to that realization before their time in the sun is over. Now, will you join me in a friendly Socratic dialogue? Now, to me, the conversation with this old man is the best interaction in the game, so out of all things I could not spoil, I'm choosing not to spoil this one. I'm only gonna show some snippets that are relevant to the story, as well as some quotes I liked. For any rule, you can imagine there are countless situations in which that rule may be suspended, and those situations are impossible to codify. If there is one thing I have observed about rules, it is that virtuous people do not need them, and evil people will always find a way around them. And so we must accept our limitations, and the sad truth that no human society will ever achieve the utopia for which it strives. In mathematics, we would call it an asymptote, a line that can be approached but never reached. I think his words put into perspective what we're all thinking by this point. I think that fundamentally, if you want to create a city without a sin, the worst thing you can do is to enforce a rule that prohibits sinning. It only serves those with the ability to exploit the rule and does nothing for those who weren't planning to sin to begin with. We see this with cases such as Malioles picking up the world's most obedient slaves despite being a terrible master, and Deshu skyrocketing prices because he knows that no one's gonna steal from him or rebel against him. And we also get to see the other side of this by looking at the slaves that would rather kill themselves rather than rebel against their master. Master, or with characters like Galerius who can trash talk their higher ups or gain authority despite doing virtually all the hard work. This law isn't exactly infeasible from a human perspective. There have been small communities that have managed to live virtuously for a number of years. It is, however, its own worst enemy. And even worse, if you really think about it, this rule creates a terrible climate of contrarianism for the sake of contrarianism to figure someone might not like. Allow me to explain. Maliolas and his gladiator could be convinced that this rule is real, but the guy that is enforcing it, Sentius, is the guy they hate and the guy they wish to overthrow. Therefore, they don't want to believe it's real because they don't like the guy pushing it down their throats. And I love how the game shows you these dynamics without spilling them out for you necessarily. There is never a conversation between Maliolus and Sentius in which Maliolus goes, I hate you and I will never accept your stupid rule. And that's what makes it even better. Anyway, back to the philosopher in the catacombs. What's your story? You mean, how did I end up living alone in this cave with nothing but these relics of the past for company? It's a long story. I'm listening. I was a quarrelsome young man. At 19, I left Corinth for Rome to study rhetoric at one of her finest academies, so I could argue more forcefully. Back then, I used to enjoy verbally sparring with everyone I could, and I was good. One night, I found myself in a tavern in an argument with a drunk mercenary. It became heated. He drew a gladius. And I won the argument, but lost my life. I woke up on the banks of the Styx at a campfire opposite Karen. Of course, I tried to persuade her to let me return, but even with all my skill, I failed. I settled in, made friends, and learned what I could, quickly realizing our little community faced certain death under the Golden Rule. So I began looking for a place to hide underground, Fortunately, I found this place waiting for me. You see, I was not the first to take refuge here. I returned to my friends above, persuaded them to join me, and twelve of us descended for the last time to live out our days hidden from Hades' tyranny. My generation was wiped out, turned to gold, many years ago. My friends and I were able to avoid the same fate by hiding down here. I think it's safest to assume that if I was to return, Hades would realize that his furies hadn't finished the job, and he'd send them after me again. Any idea where I can find the plaque that was removed from the obelisk? It is a cursed object, and I would be happy to give it to you if Kabash had not already taken it. I will tell you, but you may find him hostile. To prepare for your encounter, there are certain things you must know. 
Very few know this, but before the Romans came to this city, it was once entirely Greek. The architecture, the temples, and the people. When the Romans came, in typical fashion, they claimed it as their own, built over everything that could be built over, and renamed the things that could not. Thus, the shrine of Persephone became the shrine of Proserpina. And when they found an obelisk bearing the name Hades, they tore it off and replaced it with Pluto instead. And the city's dwindling Greek residents, witnessing this compulsive Roman conquest, decided to preserve what they could of their heritage. They gathered their art and valuables, secreted them away through the temple of Demeter, and hid them here, out of reach of the Romans. So far I'm following. However, there was one thing that always seemed out of place to me, and it is the very thing you seek. An even older plaque bearing an Egyptian inscription. How did it make it all the way here? We had no idea until years later, when the first of my friends began to die. As a result of their deaths, we began to dig catacombs branching off from this cavern to lay them to rest. We extended the tunnel so far that we accidentally discovered another, an even older tunnel, which somebody had gone to great lengths to keep hidden. Suddenly it made sense why there was an out-of-place Egyptian plaque among our people's possessions. You see, we proud Greeks had thought the Romans beasts for stealing and corrupting our heritage. But it turns out this game has been going on much longer than any of us imagined. I think it is best you head through the catacombs and follow Kabash's trail. There are certain things you must see for yourself. So now we learned that this was once a Greek city, but that's not all. Down we go, only to find the second combat area in the game. An Egyptian city just below a Greek one, which in and of itself is below a Roman one. Don't worry, it gets worse. Again, this area is very well put together. Lights are few and far in between. You might miss some enemies only for them to come chasing after you from behind. And at the end of this area is the Egyptian resident Kabash. Stop! Do not come any closer. Who are you? I am Tahenawi. I am Kabash. Hmm. And let me guess. Another Greek or Roman come to loot and plunder the resting place of my ancestors, hmm? My man, does this name sound Greek or Roman to you? Hmm. Trousers, boots, curious hair. No, I suppose you do not. Then what do you want? I'm looking for the Egyptian plaque. Hmm, to what end? I want to return it to the obelisk. Hmm, that is welcome news. You really are not Greek or Roman, are you? I was planning to return it myself, but for now, I must remain. Here, take it and restore the honor of Osiris. Now, as for the other plaque... You know where the fourth one is? Indeed. I have it right here. I stumbled across a collection of dusty curiosities while searching for a place to hide from the hungry children of Amit, and there it was. May I have it? You may not. In fact, I am about to destroy it. Why? Because it speaks a treacherous, blasphemous lie. How so? I will tell you, but first, do you know what this place is? Isn't this the Duat? Indeed. And I see you know our history. This is the Duat. See what has become of it. I have been down here for weeks, piecing together its story. And here is what I have learned. As Egypt declined and the Greeks had their turn to flourish, their souls came here in great numbers. But instead of adopting our ways, they copied and corrupted them. When they found the obelisk bearing the name Osiris, the true god of the underworld, they desecrated it, removing his name and replacing it with <sighs> Hades. Even the ferryman of the dead, known to my people long before as Kerti, they renamed to Keron. As if that desecration was not enough, they built over this place using it as the foundation for their own underworld, so that ours was forgotten. Hmm, <laughs> my only solace is that the Greeks then suffered the same fate when the Romans rose to power, renaming Hades to Pluto, and this cycle began anew. Which brings me to this other 
fourth plaque. It is inscribed with a script I do not recognize, but it is ancient, almost as if it is older than the plaque bearing Osiris' name. But if that is so, it would imply the gods of Egypt are mere imitations too, copied and corrupted from an ancient people who prospered even before us, and that my people did to them what the Greeks and Romans did to us. <sighs> but this I cannot accept. <sighs> I sense a deception. Perhaps it is the work of Set the usurper, seeking to undermine Osiris once more. What does it say? You will never know. This work of sacrilege must be destroyed, thrown into the black abyss below in Osiris' name. Please, my man, I need this. You are too late. It is done. Now I have to go after it. You would plunge into the depths of the Duat with no way back up. Madness. So we go down to get the plaque, only to find a more ancient Mesopotamian underworld. The whole place has no enemies, just Mesopotamian architecture. Wait, what's this? Does it do anything? I, I guess not. <laughs> Going further down the catacombs, we find Kabash again, and he has this to say. When I told you that you would not find a way back up, that was not a prediction. That was a promise. You will die here. Okay, just hear me out. Very well, I will listen. But if I sense deception, or if you further insult my gods, I will carry out my threat. So tell me, why should I let you live after you salvaged this instrument of blasphemy? This is one of the most annoying dialogues in the game. If you say one thing he doesn't 100% approve of, he will break the golden rule and kill you both on the spot. So it's a lot of trial and error. Luckily, I remember to save. Skyrim has taught me that much. But eventually you calm him down and explain to him that there is nothing wrong with cultures borrowing from each other and that despite the fact that he has been misled by them, that doesn't matter because they still made him a better person. He gives us the plaque, he shows us the exit, and off we go to the Great Temple. A lot of people have taken this whole different civilization stealing of one another to be an ironic form of loop within a loop, and I get it, but I feel like it can be so much more than that. See, people are undoubtedly passionate about the quality of both current and past civilizations. Weak Whoa. sperm, you are weak sperm. This is the strong sperm. This is the Greek god, okay? Greek god. The contradiction between the civilized and the barbarians is something that is virtually hand painted in this game as well as in most historical education. Yet it couldn't be any further from the truth when it comes to realistically depicting these ancient civilizations. The Greeks thought themselves as the only civilized people, the Romans thought themselves as spreaders of civilization, and the Egyptians thought they were so enlightened by the gods to the point that even their king is a god. Yet the history of these civilizations is based in what they would refer to as barbarism, had it of course been committed by someone else. The Romans began as a violent tribe from Italia, the Egyptians carved most of their empire at the backs of other Bronze Age civilizations. Just read the million dialogue if you want to understand how these civilized people talked and behave with each other. While the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. And what of the so-called barbarians? Well, most of the people Rome considered barbarians, such as the Gauls, the Germans, or the Celts, eventually became civilizations that either usurped the fame of Rome or outright outlived it. My point is, if civilizations would proudly place such emphasis on the history of their people are to be scrutinized based on the same principles they apply on the so-called barbarians, then it would be hard to observe how are they in any way different than them, except maybe the fact that they're more successful. Now, my grievances with contemporary perceptions of old nations could probably warrant another video, but I just love what the game does with this topic. Topic. It shows these shortcomings not by mentioning real life examples or showering you with different events, it merely shows you the final outcome, which is the underworld, sprinkles some questions and dialogues with NPCs, and lets you come to your own conclusions. I feel like this is a way better way of looking at it than simply going, hey look guys, it's a loop within a loop. Get it? Get it? And it also ties together the origins of civilization, according to this game at least, which will be explained inside the Great Temple. Anyway, time to throw away all the good praise I have given this game so far, because now we're getting to the final ending. We place the plaques on the obelisk, call the different names of the god of the underworld based on the different cultures that worshipped him, and the door opens. Oh wait, I know this guy. I played his faction in Warhammer. Now, I want you to think of all the wonderful things we explored here. All the beautiful topics this video game brought together, like the golden rule, questions about morality, the golden statues and their true origin, the metaphors with ancient mythology, the whole underground journey, and the perils of ancient civilizations, and think of the best possible conclusion for this story. And the answer is they went with the whole aliens thing.
So we walk up to the god slash alien of the underworld and he starts talking to us. And here you are. Allow me to introduce myself. As you have already gathered, I've been known by many names. Nergal to the Sumerians, Osiris to the Egyptians, Hades to the Greeks, and Pluto to the Romans. But the one constant through it all has been my title, God of the Underworld. And I've been watching you with curiosity, mortal, ever since your arrival. You are unlike the others, aren't you? And what is more, you carry a weapon that was never intended for mortals to wield, and you do it so brazenly. But there will be time for your reckoning later. First, as a reward for undoing the desecration of my obelisk, I will allow you to satisfy your curiosity. Ask what you will. You're a god? It is a matter of perspective. God is a label I was given by you mortals, not one I gave myself. Your ancestors revered me because to them, my knowledge and technology made me incomprehensibly powerful, just as you might seem so to an insect. But despite all that, there are rules even I must obey. Why do you look and sound like a human? My kin and I all adopted this form long ago, so that we might better understand and communicate with your kind. In time, we grew fond of the sensory delights it affords. Desire, joy, ecstasy, even rage and sorrow, while an acquired taste can be addictive. Who is this woman on the left? This is my beloved. Like me, she has been known by many names. Eresh Kigal to the Sumerians, Isis to the Egyptians, Persephone to the Greeks, and Proserpina to the Romans. Or perhaps you might know her as the goddess of springtime, the cycle of life and renewal. Your gaze lingers too long. Who is that one on the right? That is my servant. You would have met by the river, though she wears many faces and goes by many names. Kumu Tabal to the Sumerians, Kurti to the Egyptians, Charon to the Greeks, and Charon to the Romans. Her role is to ferry souls between the mortal world and this one, and to make their transition as seamless as possible. For that, she earned herself the infamous, if erroneous, moniker, the Ferryman. You will talk more later. For now, ask your questions. What is this place? It has come to be known simply as the Underworld. And it exists because of a wager I made long ago. What is the wager you made? That is a long story. One that began over 3,000 years ago and continues to this day. You see, long ago my kin and I set out from our home on Elysium to search for other forms of life among the stars. We discovered your planet and witnessed your kind evolving from primates into something lawless and barbaric. You all but destroyed yourselves, your two short lives being extinguished by violence and ignorance and disease. Yet Proserpina saw raw potential in you and persuaded the rest of us it would be squandered without our intervention and stewardship. So we revealed ourselves to your people in a place called Sumer. We offered guidance in agriculture, toolcraft and law, and you called us gods. For a time you flourished, but soon you were too many for us to oversee. And as you spread from that cradle of civilization, we saw something disturbing. We had sown the seeds of dependency and confusion, and soon you returned to your old ways of violence and ignorance, this time in our name. My kin had seen enough, and gave up on your kind, condemning you as barbaric and chaotic, scarcely more than animals. We began preparations to return to Elysium, our home world, a utopia unspoilt by conflict, and unimaginable in its beauty. But my Proserpina could not bear to abandon your kind without guidance, and knowing it would force the rest of us to leave her behind, she made an extraordinary sacrifice. She gave up her immortality to descend permanently to the ranks of humankind. 
And so she began her inescapable trajectory toward death. Horrified, I acted swiftly. I placed her in suspended animation in a deep frozen sleep to prevent age and sickness from claiming her. And then I pleaded with Proserpina's father, who the Romans called Jupiter, to bring her with us to Elysium. It was and is my hope that once there, we might one day learn to undo what she has done to herself. But he refused. I did everything I could to persuade him, but he would not relent. He would rigidly uphold his final pronouncement. Humans were unworthy of ascension to Elysium, and no exceptions would be made. But seeing that I was aggrieved, he proposed a wager, the terms of which were as follows. If even one human city could prove itself capable of living without sin for a single year, then Proserpina and all of humanity would be permitted to join us in Elysium. My part would be to remain behind, the last of my kind, to watch over you without interfering, and to sit in silent judgment. And so my reward has been to languish here, enduring a 3,000 year winter, waiting for the day your kind proves itself worthy of her faith in you, so that I might take her with me to Elysium and unthaw my goddess of springtime. And here I am, after all this time, still waiting. How did you decide which people come here? To ensure the wage was fair, it was important that my subjects were chosen at random. To this end, I had my servant distribute a thousand tokens fashioned from silver, a rare element at the time, across all of Sumer. Whoever died while in possession of one of them would be located by my servant and ferried to this place, with no memory of how they arrived. As the tokens were discovered, they were traded, smelted, and fashioned into trinkets, and eventually coins, spreading to Egypt like seeds on the wind. Later, when they spread to Greece, they would come to be known as Charon's Obel, or as coins for the ferrymen. Some placed coins in the mouths of their dead, hoping they would awaken here, though they had no way of knowing which coins were fashioned from the original tokens. In fact, almost all of the tokens are accounted for, only two remain. And so after this wave destroys itself, as it is destined to do, your kind will have squandered the last of its potential to ascend beyond this rock, and Proserpina's along with it. What do you consider a sin? I've always considered that the cornerstone of morality is the ability to determine right from wrong on one's own. No attempt to lay our rules like your Code of Hammurabi or your Twelve Tables of the Roman Republic can ever cover all possible scenarios. This should come as no surprise to you since the core principle has been expressed in many forms by many of your civilizations. The Egyptians made a rudimentary attempt with do to the doer to make him do. The Greeks refined it with avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. The Roman Stoics added, treat your inferior as you would wish your superior to treat you. Even the so-called cultists hiding among you often say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is the simplest of concepts, and each one of you is born with the faculties required to apply it to any situation. Yet none of the peoples who expressed this rule were able to uphold it. Curious, is it not? These are all my questions. Good. Then now it is time for your reckoning. Only, it seems, something is wrong. It has long been within my power to see into the hearts of mortals and weigh their deeds in life. But, when I peer into you, I see only a blank slate, as if you did not exist until you appeared in this city. How is this possible? Charon, where did you find this one? I do not remember ferrying you. How did you come here? Maybe you are getting forgetful in your old age. You would have us believe that my servant merely forgot bringing you here. Hmm, that sounds improbable to me. Carol, 
Does this mortal speak the truth? Or should I strike her down where she stands? Perhaps. The waters of the River Lathe are known to have that effect. Hmm. I will take you at your word. But as long as your past remains shrouded in mystery, it seems I must put your reckoning on hold. But answer this. Why have you come here? What is it you seek? I want to put an end to the Golden Rule. <laughs> Your hubris is amusing, so I will allow you to make your case. But I warn you, if you anger me or waste my time with lies or wrong-headed arguments, you face death here. So, tell me, why should I put an end to the so-called Golden Rule? A couple of things to note before we get to the final dialogue. Notably, um, WTF, what is this? Secondly, here we have a bunch of options to convince this guy to end the circus. You can go into combat, take Persepina's crown, and then run through the portal, and then come back to him only to convince him that you have bested him before and that he shouldn't mess with you. Alternatively, you can go with the Silver Tongue path and just hit all the right dialogue options. And given that it's been a while since I've thrown some real shade, I'll go with that one. And fair warning, this guy talks like he committed to a single politics course in university, and now he can't take an L to save his life. How can you expect us not to sin if you yourself have sinned? That is a very serious accusation, mortal. What sin have I committed? What evidence do you have to support it? You have given terrible punishment to hundreds of people, some of whom for minor sins, and some others have committed no sin at all. Every one of those people was guilty of failing to ensure their peers lived virtuously. They failed collectively, and so they were punished collectively. The Romans understand this, as did the Greeks before them. If our positions were reversed, you wouldn't want me to punish you for the sins of other people, would you? Ah, but I am a god, and you are a mortal. Why would you expect me to treat you as I treat my own kind? You are not a peer. You are not a respected equal. Let me ask you this. Do you treat insects as you wish to be treated? Do you care for their well-being as you would your fellow man? Do you ensure they have food and shelter and protection from predators? Do you give them rights? No. Of course not. Because that would be absurd, just as it would be absurd for me to treat your kind as equals. What makes your kind superior to mine? Where to begin? Our lifespans exceed yours by thousands of years, in which time we accumulate vast wisdom and a mastery of technology you cannot begin to imagine. Why do you think wisdom and technology makes you superior? Because that is the source of our power over you. So you think you're not obliged to treat us fairly just because you are more powerful than us, right? Hmm, you could say that. Didn't the Roman Stoic say, treat your inferior as you wish your superior treated you? My kin have no superiors. But you said Jupiter was your leader. There is a hierarchy in your kin. Hmm, that is true. Go on. I'm saying, if you can follow your own rule, how can you expect humans to do so? Let me ponder that for a moment. If you are right, then it would follow that all this time, I have been in the wrong. But, no, the very thought of it aggrieves me. How can I accept your argument, when doing so would make me a tyrant and a monster? You're just human, we all make mistakes, and we all have a tendency towards sin. You have spoken eloquently, and yet, if what you say is true, it follows that my wager was fatally flawed from the beginning. But that would mean Jupiter, Preservator's father, who knew more about you than anyone, proposed a wager I could never win. Why would he do that? Perhaps he wanted you to abandon your wager so Preserpina can finally be free from you. Perhaps. But if that was so, surely I would have sensed his deception. How could I have been so blind for so long? Perhaps your love blinded you. It's very human. <sighs> Your words sting me, mortal. But perhaps it is what I deserve. As difficult as this is to admit, I have suspected as much for a long time now. And I cannot deny it any longer. I've been so fixated on taking my beloved to Elysium that every time one of you sinned, it wore away my hope of being with her again. 
In time, I began to despise your kind for making her believe that you could ever be better than you are. But my rage was not born of malice. Quite the opposite. Everything I have done, I did because I loved her. Who knew this empathy of yours, which you celebrate so much, could have such a dark underside? This has gone on too long. It is time for me to let go of this form, of her, of all of you. But know this, if I abandon the way journey for Elysium, neither she nor your kind may ever ascend. Dude, we just want to go home. Hmm. Very well. I will have Charon make arrangements to ferry the others. But as for you, be aware you will be separated from the rest. Why? Once this exodus begins, the events that brought you to this moment will never have taken place. And you will have created a paradox. What will become of you is difficult to predict. But that is the risk you have taken by interfering in the natural flow of time. Now, are you ready? Farewell, mortal. So we go back to the overworld, Karon gets all sassy with us for putting her out of a job, and much like the second and third ending, we get back to civilization. But this is not where the story ends this time. To make things even more cheesy, we get a flash forward one year into the future, and apparently, everyone from the city not only escaped, but they also teleported to the present day along with us. Well, except Sentius who got punished to stay there as the last statue in the underworld. I'm living by myself on a little vineyard in Umbria. It's something Olpius and I used to talk about doing when we got out. And I thought that's what he would have wanted. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell Galerius to tell Ulpius not to play Assassin's Creed. Whoops. But it wasn't just them who escaped. Check this out. <laughs> Sorry if I frightened you. Just a little joke I've been saving for a long, long time. Allow me to introduce myself properly. I am Proserpina, former goddess of the cycle of life and renewal. And now, a regular mortal. I wanted to meet you in person. And thank you for freeing all these people, and me. I hate to think what would have happened to us without your intervention. It was nice meeting you. And you. Although it feels like I've known you forever. Oh, and one last thing. Do you remember all those golden statues scattered throughout the city? Good. Because they remember you. Well done, my friend. Of all the heroes who ever turned to the underworld in return, None came close to achieving what I did. Hercules, Orpheus, Theseus, and the Nymphs would be proud. It's strangely wholesome. If only it wasn't so extremely awkward as a climax. Maybe it's just me. As I said, a lot of people said that they really liked the ending. Maybe the History Channel forever ruined any prospect I had of accepting aliens as the creators of human civilization seriously. At least not beyond the meme level. And in fairness, it does the very good job of explaining all the loose ends left behind by the story. But it also feels like the developers decided to go with the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse ending. No matter what happens, everyone gets way too enthusiastic at the end, they all throw a party, and in said party, they throw the fattest moves imaginable. I saw a lot of people praising the ending and and how well put together it is and well i wish i could say the same honestly there's something about it man i don't know don't get me wrong it's executed as well as a tada it was alien's revelation can be executed but does that really say much i'll let you decide on that because well this was the fourth ending and no matter what your opinion on the ending is it's still an excellent game it mixes so many different things so well if you're a fan of narrative games this is definitely one worth playing even if I just spoil to you like 85% of the game. But hey, if you're interested, this game has the most unintentionally comedic speedrun routes I have ever seen. What you say? If you put this game, and in fact this video, at the back of your mind for a year or two, and end up forgetting most of the major plot points, then just remember this. This game is still worth checking out. As I said at the beginning, I was introduced to this game when it was still a mod, and oh boy, what a way it has come. The mod is still pretty good, don't get me wrong, but the game is better. Hopefully, someday, I will talk about something that doesn't have to do with Elder Scrolls in one way or another. Until that day comes, however, this video is over. But Fabia, no!